Hi, I'm Amanda Steele from CBRE. And right now there's a building revolution going on in Australian cities. Urban environments are being transformed from places where we live and work into spaces that we love. And you'll see the very best of it here on The Placemakers. The spaces we live in are important, and by putting people at the heart of the design process, the professionals, the planners, the architects, developers, builders, they can directly impact the health and happiness of the communities that we live in. The idea of creating spaces for people is called placemaking, and I think it's the greatest opportunity Australian cities have this century. And the concept doesn't just apply to residential developments, our homes and public spaces. Charter Hall is one Australian company that has invested in placemaking and now attracts and retains the best people in their business. I want to talk to you about how placemaking drives culture. How does that happen at Charter Hall? It's actually been a great enabler of things. So we acquired a business twice the size of us. Yeah, wow. And a wonderful thing happened in that we ran out of space. So how we... is that wonderful? <laughs> well, because space gave us an opportunity to really do something different. In a way, through space, create a symbol of what we wanted to be and enable the way we wanted people to work together. We looked at both space, technology and behaviour yeah, great. through that lens. When you came into this space, you were clear on how how the place would inform culture? Very clear, because we had, as an executive group, decided this was a cultural play versus an efficiency play. So we have three V's that we built the whole place around, which was passion, collaboration and accountability. And so everything in the place is centred on those three values. So the passion is how the energy of the people and their excitement is portrayed in the place and how people who come in can be part of it. Mm -hmm. The collaboration piece was how could we get people to work cross-functionally or in whichever team we wanted them to work in. And then the accountability piece was driven by the transparency of the place. But there's a lot of different space around here. I think that's why I like the, the fit out so much. There's this kind of really creative space. There's some very quiet spaces. You've got a diversity of space. I feel like people need caves and campfires. Mm -hmm. There's different people who need different things and get their energy in different ways. And some people need all of it yeah. and some people have a preference and then you need to be able to provide all of those spaces for different pieces of work. The thing that drives the success of the space is people's consciousness around yes. what they're doing and who they're working with and therefore the space that they need to use. And I guess that for me is the crux of placemaking and how we've changed is that the workplace is no longer just about work. Work and life is integrated versus separate and balanced. Yeah. And this is your fire? This is our fire which for the induction is usually in the middle mm -hmm. and we all gather around. Yep. Um, and we have lovely sessions, like the founder of our business is still with us. Yeah. And so he comes in and does an elder and a young gun story. Yeah, great. And we have different people walking us through the timeline of our business yeah. through storytelling. Yeah. We've been fortunate in that we've continued to grow. Yeah. So we've continued to be able to take up space. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's an evolving thing. Mm -hmm. So in in taking up the space, we've been able to look at, oh, how are people using the space? What are they showing they need more of? What else could we add? Mm. And that's been a gift in itself because you've been able to really finesse it, I guess. Yes. How do you know it's working? A few things. So anecdotally, I think we got so many comments around pride mm. and feeling like they could show off their workplace and attract investors and, and, and really show our culture. And then through other tangible measures like engagement and turnover. So when we came in in the first two years, we remeasured engagement. We had a really big increase in engagement and a huge decrease in turnover. Where's the space that you enjoy the most? I have two spaces, depending on, I guess, what I need. One space is up just near the deck. There's lots of energy. Yes. And then when I need to hide away and be in my cave, I come down to the den, which is a space we've created for, I guess, reflection and thinking. Mm. I love the peacefulness of it, and I feel inspired by the books and ideas and the great minds in a way that are, are lining the shelves. Yeah, great. Yeah. Coming up, an urban village with the world's tallest vertical gardens and how great placemaking turned an old racetrack into a fabulous inner city precinct. So here we are at Central Park.
Park in downtown Chippendale, a beautiful site on the Carlton United Brewery former site. It's been transformed into an excellent residential, retail and community space. So let's meet Paolo and see what he has to say. I love this space. I've always loved this space and I think a lot of other people do too. How do you create a space that people love? Well, I think it's, uh, we're very excited to be part of this, this project um, and it's taken a long time. It's a 10-year horizon to develop something like this. And this is a unique space, so close to the CBD, almost six hectares. You don't get many opportunities to create something world class. So, but also bringing together a posse, effectively, of the world's best designers, you know, yeah. and architects. Paolo, place making is all about engaging with the community, making sure they're happy around what the facilities are and how they can use it. How did you do that here? We started by listening to the community. There's some really visible things that we've done. You know, the vertical garden is uh, really goes a long way to demonstrating our commitment from a sustainability perspective. Good visual connection. There's the open space. It's quite a lot of kind of park area for a, it's such a dense development. And in there we've incorporated again public art. The Halos is a wind powered kinetic art installation, which is really interesting. Beautiful. We've kind of restored the heritage or retained a lot of that and converted it into different uses. And was that important for the community, that heritage aspect? Yeah, there's that really strong connection to what was here. You know, a lot of people were opposed to the development, so trying to retain some of that history was really important to the community. And so we've, we've done that very really well. And then the other thing is the heliostat. You'll notice quite visible thing, kind of cantilevered out from one of the central park towers and really pro provides an important element to getting daylight into the retail space by reflecting the light with mirrors down into that space. Yeah, that's clever, isn't it? Yeah. So tell me about the sustainability initiatives. You know this is something that's near, near and dear to my heart. Yeah, there's a lot of them. So you look at the vertical garden, designed by Patrick Blanc, who's one of the renowned botanists and, and designers. A thousand square metres, mm. the world's tallest vertical garden. Pretty amazing initiative in itself. It's a really special feel to look out over the, the kind of the city and the surrounds and look through plants. There's a central thermal plant which most of it's underground and that provides cleaner energy to every building in this development. There's a recycled water factory. Over a million litres a day of recycled water gets pushed around this development. So again, the vertical gardens are irrigated with that recycled water. Fantastic. What we've really tried to create is an urban village. It's a space where you can pretty much do everything you need to do day to day. And, We've created kind of the modern contemporary version here in a, in a really dense environment, close to the CBD, and I think we've done an okay job of that. So this beautiful urban village has retained its fantastic heritage features, ultimately because that's what the community demanded. And I think we're better off for it. I love this space. Inner Sydney has been transformed by the development of Harold Park, where a completely new precinct has been designed and constructed around the principles of placemaking. This used to be a racetrack. People love it so much that over 1,300 new apartments were sold three years ahead of schedule, and I want to talk to the CEO of Mervac, Susan Lloyd Hurwitz, to understand how they did it. Mervac is a very large organisation, a very impressive organisation. Tell me what you think placemaking is. I think ultimately placemaking is all about human interaction. It's all about creating places where people can connect, where they want to be, where they want to dwell. A place that is well made mm. helps the health of a community in connecting human beings together. A great mixed use development from my perspective, which is the Harold Park redevelopment. So tell me a little bit about where that started. Well, that was a site that Mervac bought back in 2010 and uh, really had a vision for a vibrant community right next to the CBD. So it couldn't be dramatically different than the surrounding terrace stock in Glebe, yes, yeah. but it had to also be future looking. So you'll see the design really picked up the terrace idea from Glebe, but took it to the next level and put it into high density in the form of Harold Park. What kind of people live in that development? There are young professionals, there are young families, there are downsizers, uh, and really it's people who are looking for inner urban amenity quality design in a place which has 35% of the site being open space with connection to the city. So Susan, the tram sheds is a very different retail development because it doesn't have clothing shops or news agencies. It's very food based. So was that in response to the community? It was the idea, we called it connecting people to providors. Mm. And we were looking for those food operators who are absolutely passionate and it's very theatrical retail. So the pasta makers making pasta in the window and the bread makers milling the flour. Mm. And that really connected in with the customer base that is in 
in the inner urban area. But then adding to it the things that the local community needs. So there is a supermarket offering, a barber and a pharmacy and a gym, but housed in this amazing heritage building yeah. uh, with bits of the old legacy still there. So the graffiti is still on the wall. The placemaking elements that you have at the Harold Park development, how do you know they've been successful? I think because it resonated so well with customers. Yeah. So we sold out all of the apartments three years quicker than we thought we would. It's uh, already won six awards, including Best New Precinct. And there's going to be two and a half thousand people living there, um, proud to call Harold Park home. This development to me is fascinating because they've taken what used to be a raceway and turned it into a really beautiful suburb. But they've also held on to some of the heritage. I love the graffiti. You can really see how people enjoy the restaurants. And I particularly love the way it interacts with the park around it. After the break, we explore the Rialto and emergence of Midtown Melbourne and the stunning workplaces at Lendlease. So here I am at Barangaroo, I've come to see Lendlease. They're well known for building communities and buildings, but I'm talking to Natalie about how they build a workplace. Natalie, here we are at the beautiful Lendlease Global Head Office. That must have been a challenge, designing the workplace here. Well, making a place for the placemakers was a real, um, what should we say, a no pressure moment. <laughs> Our philosophy is always when creating a new workplace or even a new whole place like a precinct to talk to the people. I mean, at the end of the day, the customer has got to be the one that leads the solution. I think the most innovative thing that has been done at Barangaroo is around embracing a diversity in this precinct. I mean, manufacturing a whole new place where there was no streetscape, no, no people here before, isn't an easy task. Yeah. And so what would you say are the essential measures of success for a placemaking concept in the workforce. These physical places need to create experiences these days to really be the place of choice. Yeah. For me, the measure of success is create a place people really want to be. And what do you enjoy the most of this place? I love the cafe the most. I'm very social. I'm one of those people who can work in a buzzy environment yeah. and that really suits me well. The big, beautiful wooden table. And by huge contrast, the green work points that are very near to the window, mm -hmm. the focus points. I think we often forget the workplace is a sanctuary as well as a place for bringing people together. Those two contrasts work very well for me here. Yeah, beautiful. For a long time, sustainability has been about just the environment and it's certainly changed recently to embrace wellness. Are you seeing that take place in the workforce? I think it's actually one of the leading drivers of change in the workplace at the moment is health and well-being. We have given over spaces for health and well-being. We've created spaces where people can you know, be, be alone. At consultations with the health professionals, we give flu jabs every year to people if they want it. And, and nutrition, I should say, is another topic of, of thought here. You won't find too many fast food chains in this precinct. So Natalie, the big question, how do you keep everybody happy in a big workforce? Lots of complaints about the workplace are really about having a lack of choice. Mm. So what we've done here is, yes, you have a team home and you have a sense of belonging, but the choices are very important after that point. So what if that team table or that team home doesn't suit you? Yes. If you have to take a phone call quickly, are there spaces that are non-bookable? Mm. We've tried to keep it simple, but it's all about really fine-tuning the choices. I'm old enough to remember how we used to work, like battery chickens, all locked in little offices, not connecting, not engaging with each other. I love this new workplace of the future, and I think Natalie and Lendlease have done a beautiful job of it. So here we are at Rialto Tower, a 30-year-old office building in the heart of a precinct. It's done a great job of reinventing itself and delivering on excellent placemaking. Lorenz, we're here at Rialto Towers. It's a beautiful space. This building has a long history though, yes? It has had a long history, yes. So how long have you been operating here? The family's been involved with Rialto for more than 30 years. I Personally, I've been actively involved for about 18 or 19 years. Okay, and recently you've rejuvenated the space? Well, we like to call it a regeneration. So the building's more than 30 years old and we've been planning the regeneration for the last 10 years and it's actually exciting seeing it come to fruition. And at what stage does placemaking become important in that regeneration? Uh, placemaking is absolutely paramount. Placemaking is a term that a lot of people use, but uh, we're actually living and breathing it here at Rialto. And how do you define it? What's placemaking for you? Placemaking is about people. 
and partly curating space and having different layers of uses and, and bringing people. People bring people. So you've got this beautiful big office tower. How do you get people to connect in it? We uh, created a digital platform called Equium six years ago, taking something like Facebook and real estate and trying to blend them together. Fantastic. We want to better connect with our 4,000 plus people in the building. I love the way you describe it as Facebook for buildings. What can you do on it? Many things, but uh, it's a concierge desk. It's uh, a news and events page. It enables you to actually buy a sandwich or a coffee and have it delivered to your desk. Great. And, and a full suite of other, other services that are on offer here at Rialto. See, I love that. I think we used to connect in the village square and now you've found a way for technology to connect people within a building. Absolutely. You know, the village square is still important. We've basically uh, recreated our own piazza. Uh, to have a real sense of community and the, the, the interaction of people face to face is just so important for placemaking. That it's not just about the office tower. I mean, we, we've got the Intercontinental next door, we've got the restaurants, we've got our piazza. And part of our challenge is to make sure that we turn the Rialto precinct and, and Midtown, because uh, Melbourne has changed, into a vibrant 24 7 workplace. Lorenz, this is gorgeous. It is amazing. This is a view de Mon, view of the world. And this is all about placemaking. I really think we need a champagne. <laughs> what I really enjoyed about the Rialto is Lorenz and his family history, the connection with the place, and how they're building a legacy for Melbourne going forward. It's a 30-year-old building and it's been completely rejuvenated to ensure that it will be here in the future. After the break, it's James Street, Brisbane, and the economics of placemaking. I'm here in James Street, Brisbane, a beautiful retail street, to speak to the architects of the development about their contribution to placemaking. Ingrid and Adrian, thank you so much for your time. It's a beautiful street, James Street, and it's probably my favourite retail district in Australia. It looks like it's been here forever, but it actually hasn't. So what's the history of the space? At one stage it had the Coca-Cola factory what? here in Brisbane. It was light industrial for many years, and that's where you see the majority of building stock around you, the tilt-up concrete with the bolted-on steelwork. And, and that was an economical way to create these large areas of showroom in what wasn't a highly revered precinct at that stage. Yeah. The cinema was built through that process and then later on there's been a change of guard from a smaller group of developers and probably a key project was the construction of the James Street Market which meant that we had occupation on a daily basis and so suddenly the nature of the precinct changed and it's turned into what you see today which is predominantly fashion retail. So Adrian, for people who haven't been here, describe James Street for us. Well, it's not very big. It's only sort of two blocks really of street front, but I think the precinct is much larger. So when you wander off James Street, there's a whole network of smaller pedestrian spaces that in some ways are more interesting and, and offer a different scale to the high street itself. I think as architects, you're often driving the narrative for a, a space, a place. Do you worry about handing that narrative over to developers? What happens down here is that we've got this strange hybrid between a street-based retail that is curated by a small group. So it's the best of both worlds. What they've done is they've formed the James Street Initiative, this strategy of working together, which is not a normal strategy for development groups. They said we're going to we're friends, we're going to band together and we're going to make this something great. Adrian, it's so difficult to get good place in a single building. How do you do it for a whole street? Well, we've tried very hard to introduce a limited palette of materials that we reuse and sometimes that's just matching a colour, but on the ground, for example, we've tried to use the same paving throughout the precinct. The schedule of planting continues across different buildings. The height and scale of the buildings are yes. all the same and so it holds together as a precinct. Yeah, beautiful. And Ingrid, what's your favourite place? I think the rooftop gardens to 19 Wandu Street, which is a West Elm tenancy. And what about you, Adrian? What do you love the most? It's probably <laughs> the spaces where we've introduced a garden at ground level mm, that's yeah. is now magical because the plants have taken over. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Well, it's a great precinct. Congratulations to you. We've seen how great placemakers are transforming urban Australia. They're putting people first and giving them spaces they want. I asked Nerida Connorsby what the latest trends are. Nerida, as an economist, I'm really interested in how people are changing the way they live and what's driving that change. 
Yeah, so it's interesting on our realestate.com.au site, we have around 6 million people on the site every single month. Mm. So what we're finding on site in terms of lifestyle, people really want good public transport, they want good schools, they want good retailing, they don't like congestion, Yes. but they still want the big family homes. So I think this is a trade-off that people are having to make, deciding, you know, do I go a smaller home, do I go an apartment to get that lifestyle, or, or do I go further out and sacrifice lifestyle for a big home? And so how are developers responding to that? Well, developers are really providing housing in great locations. You know, we, we are seeing higher densities in inner urban areas. If you can't give people lifestyle in the outer suburbs, but you can in the inner suburbs, providing housing where they want it is, is a sensible response. They're also providing lots of community amenities. You know, they are often providing parks, good coffee shops, yes. restaurants, you know, all those things that people are really after. And are there suburbs that do lifestyle really well? Are you seeing those suburbs emerge with great placemaking? Absolutely. I mean, if you have a look in places like Brisbane, we're seeing very high lifestyle elements there and a lot of young people are moving there as a result. You know, Sydney, in Melbourne, you know, they, they do offer great lifestyle elements as well. At the moment, many outer urban areas find it a bit tougher to provide those lifestyle elements, but you know, some new developments are doing doing really well as well. We've seen some beautiful places, buildings that look like gardens, workplaces that cater to people's motions and moods and tell a story. We've seen streetscapes and precincts that deliver on culture and values. I think good placemaking is changing Australian cities for the better and I think it's changing the lives of people who live in them too. Thank you for watching, I'm Amanda Steele, see you next time.